Welcome, Anita. Thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for <laughs> taking time out of your busy schedule to, to chat to us. Can you tell us what it is that you do and how, how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, so, um, well, I'm a gynaecologist. Um, so, well, I'm a doctor, work in the NHS, and I specialize in obstetrics and gynaecology. So obstetrics is looking after pregnant women, um, delivering babies, um, and then gynaecology is basically any kind of women's health um, related to periods and hormones um, and all those kinds of things. So how did I get here? Well, it's been a bit of an off-piste route. Um, so when I was about five, I think I wanted, I decided I wanted to be a doctor. So it's been a very long ambition of mine. Um, and then I didn't actually get into medical school the first time that I tried. So I was like, hmm, what am I going to do now? So I went to university because I was just kind of like desperate to leave home. I went to university and studied um, medical biochemistry. So that was a really good opportunity, uh, and I got into research um, when I was doing that. So I, I worked in a research lab for a while, and we were looking at the anti-cancer mechanisms of certain food compounds, so things like turmeric, um, and then resveratrol, which is in uh, wine, um, and then also lots of, of the compounds in green vegetables. Then I eventually did go to medical school, and when I was at medical school, I decided I wanted to be a transplant surgeon. Um, well, that didn't happen because I then um, did obs and gynae at the end of medical school and was like, wow, this is really fascinating. Um, so after medical school, you have to work for a couple of years doing lots of different kinds of uh, medical jobs in different specialties. And I did have an obs and gynae job and I absolutely loved it. And then I applied for specialist training in obstetrics and gynecology. And uh, guess what? I didn't get the job. <laughs> so this is a bit of a recurring theme. Right, yeah. um, but I was pretty persistent and I knew it, that's definitely what I wanted to do. Um, so I actually applied for a research job in obs and gynae. Um, and then on my first day, the professor that I was working for, he was like, well, why are you just coming for a year? Why don't you just do a PhD? So I was like, mm, OK. That's, that suits me fine, yes. um, which sounds like a strange way to get into doing a PhD, but that's what happened. And then during the time that I was doing my PhD, I um, got a training number. So I started doing my training and then finished the PhD. Actually, um, well, I have my Viva in July, so that's all finished now. Um, and then so in the last few years, I've been just finishing that off in my spare time, spare time, um, and then also working full time. Um, so yeah, at the moment I work full time in the NHS and then I do research on the side. Um, but then also a few years ago, I started to become quite frustrated by the kind of information about women's health that was out there. And I saw a lot of things um, online, in newspapers, and particularly in women's magazines that were just really misleading, but also completely wrong um and i just from talking to patients in clinic i just realized that people just had no idea about really simple things about women's health and not through any fault of their own just from you know the fact that education at school is terrible you know periods and hormones are not something that we're really um that cool with talking about kind of just generally well certainly not a few years ago i think that's changed over the last year or so maybe um, but, you know, I, I just felt that there was a need for women to be able to get some kind of engaging but reliable information. So I set up a blog and an Instagram account, um, which, again, I do in my spare time. Um, but I just absolutely love it. And it's, uh, yeah, it's just great to be able to provide information for women. But also, it just gives me a great opportunity to really keep up to date with what kind of things people, you know, myths people are reading, what people want to know, so that I can just really keep up to date with what my patients want and make sure that I can give that um, information to them. Amazing. And it is incredible how little we know about that very important area of our bodies. And yeah. What, what sort of myths have you heard? I'm really curious when you say myths. What's, <laughs> what are we talking? What do they publish I mean, in magazines? Oh, gosh, so many things. Um, I think, well, first of all, just, you know, the basic questions that I ask people every day in clinic, for example, like, how long is your uh, menstrual cycle? And people will say, oh, maybe like three or four days. But 
that's actually how long your period lasts for. So your menstrual cycle is the whole month and just kind of little things like that. And, you know, if you're going to a doctor and they're asking you these questions and, you know, you're already nervous because you are worried about, you know, things that you might have to tell them, um, but also the fact that you might have to get undressed in front of them and they might do something that might be a bit uncomfortable, you know, just to, you know, also feel like I don't really know what the right answer is also breeds more anxiety mm. so just little things like that um things i've read in women's magazines all sorts of things about lots of you know like selling lots of products that people don't need um lots of kind of supplements and alternative therapies that people are really pushing really hard and whilst i'm very open-minded i really do practice evidence-based medicine so i think as a doctor i'm almost in a position of power that if I say something is good or you should do it, I feel that, you know, people will listen to that. So I feel really strongly that if I'm recommending something, I have to be able to provide the evidence to say this is actually something that's proven to be safe or to work. So I feel that, you know, a lot of magazines don't necessarily have that sort of social responsibility. So they're the kind of things that, you know, I pick up a lot on and, and like to um, kind of explain in my posts and things yeah yeah amazing the word the word Gwyneth Paltrow springs to mind for me <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> various obscure things actually I quite like Gwyneth Paltrow I think she gets a bad a bad rap but um yeah she has some interesting things yeah I think she's um she's gone pretty wild um <laughs> But then, you know, I think it's difficult, isn't it? Because I think sometimes just kind of like not realizing that something that seems maybe quite inert could actually be harmful. Because I think there's a big, um, you know, this big idea that everything natural is better. And, you know, some of the most dangerous compounds are natural, if you think about it, like arsenic is a natural compound. I think that's one that always gets wheeled out. Um, but, you know, I think that she's probably gone slightly down the route of, you know, uh, you know, natural is great, but it isn't always better. Um, and I think that that has become a little bit misleading for people. And she probably, you know, maybe doesn't realize that some of the things she's promoting aren't necessarily that safe or, or effective or, you know, could potentially do harm. So I think it's maybe lack of insight as well. Um, I don't think that she's actively seeking to try and harm people. But then also I think when you, um, when you have the sort of the business side of things as well, you know, wanting to push products and things, then you can slightly lose perspective then as well. So I think, you know, if you are looking at you know, somebody who's not a medical professional recommending something for a medical problem, I think it's always important to take a step back and just think, what is their motivation? Why are they mm -hmm. recommending this to me? Um, is it, you know, for their financial gain, maybe? So that's uh, probably one of my biggest tips for people when they're looking at information online, I would say. That is such good advice. Yeah, especially in a world of paid Instagram posts when people aren't necessarily admitting that they're paid and kind of yeah, the, blur, exactly. the lines are very much blurred in terms of that. I think that's very good advice. Exactly. And I think that that's the thing, you know, Instagram is so unregulated. Um, and I have to be really careful because so I'm regulated by the General Medical Council. So they give me my license to practice. So if I'm doing something that's unethical from sort of a medical perspective, then I can be somebody, anybody on social media could report me to the GMC and say, look, Anita's saying something that's completely nonsense and potentially harm so i have to be really careful um in that way but other people don't necessarily have that regulation um so again it's just kind of who who, who is recommending it what kind of regulation do they have well i'm glad i'm glad you're here i'm glad you exist and you're <laughs> someone to be trusted um i'm really curious about what are the what are the common questions that you get asked because i know you get asked a lot of questions obviously mm. in your practice and on social media what are the common things that come up again and again I think a lot of the questions that I get asked are really centered around people wondering if they are normal in many aspects so I think you know something something I get asked a lot in clinic is people saying does my vagina look normal I get asked that a lot. Yeah. Um, and I think it's because people have become more sort of aware. Um, so first of all, 
your vagina is inside. So that's the tube inside. And so it's the vulva that's on the outside. Um, and so that's what people really mean. So does the outside, does the external genitalia look normal? And I mean, I look at vulvas all day, every day, and there's no such thing as abnormal, really. But we're kind of fed this idea that your labia um, have to be symmetrical and that they shouldn't be in any way visible. Um, and there's also a lot of talk about labiaplasty. And if you look online um, on YouTube and even on Instagram, there's lots of um, plastic surgeons who are talking about, you know, popping in to have this done. And, you know, it's actually a big operation. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's not something you can just pop in and have done on your lunch break. Um, but it also precipitates this idea that, you know, it's something abnormal to not have these very neat symmetrical labia I mean I can tell you that I've seen I think I've seen five vulvas today and they all look completely different and none of them were symmetrical but they were all perfect so you know there's just everyone is normal in that respect the other thing that really breeds a lot of anxiety is about vaginal discharge so it's completely normal to get discharged. And a lot of people think that it's a symptom, but it's basically how your body protects itself. So it's a lubricant, it's a moisturizer. So it stops kind of like chafing, which a lot of people think is really funny, but you know, that, that's why it exists. Um, but it also contains lots of really um, useful protective compounds. So kind of like natural antibiotics they're called. So special proteins that um, prevent infections, um, so it's it's got a lot of properties and also it is how you get pregnant because um, when you're fertile, there's a particular kind of discharge that is produced that actually aids the passage of the sperm to the um, inside the uterus where it'll find the eggs. So it's something that's just completely essential for life. Um, but, you know, people are quite anxious about it because it does change throughout the month. And that, again, is normal. So I'm a massive fan of people kind of really getting to know their own bodies and learning what's normal. So just kind of like very briefly, when you are finishing your period, you can get a quite thick, um, often quite yellow discharge. Um, and that can cause a lot of anxiety because people, everyone thinks that yellow is something bad, <laughs> something, you know, dirty or whatever. Um, and it can be quite dry. And then as you go towards the middle of the cycle, when you're going to ovulate, then it becomes like really, really thin, like egg white, it can be really, really watery. Um, and then again, as you go towards the end of the cycle, um, when your period is going to start again, it can be quite thick and again, quite like very white, even gray, yellow, all these different kind of colors. Um, and that's sort of how it would normally fluctuate throughout the month. So it's kind of having an awareness of the fact that first it is normal to have discharge, but it will change and kind of just keeping an eye and, and seeing what's, what's there, what it's like. Um, and just being aware that it is actually a positive thing that we do have discharge. Um, I think the other thing really is about periods because we just don't talk enough about periods. You know, I get people coming to see me who have had problems with their periods for years if not decades and so many people when I ask them you know why did you not come sooner obviously in a polite way I'm not judging anyone you don't have to you know go straight to the doctor you can see how you, how things are going but when someone's had problems for, I mean I have patients who come who've had torrentially heavy periods for years and years and years to the point where they've had to be admitted to hospital because they're anemic and they need a blood transfusion and you just say, you know, why did you not come? And they just said, well, I thought this was normal. And that's because we just don't talk to each other about what our periods are like. So for me, I, I talk to people all day, every day about their periods. So I know exactly what periods can be like. But, you know, for somebody who's never spoken to anybody about their periods, that, you know, their period is is what a period is like. So if you have this torrentially heavy period, then you just think, okay, that's normal and that's what I have to put up with. But it's not. So if your period is concerning you in any way, if you're worried that it's very heavy, it's very painful, um, anything about it that concerns you, I highly recommend going to speak to someone because generally speaking, 
it's not something that you need to put up with. Um, and that just makes me really sad, actually, when I see someone who has been struggling for so long, who just didn't know that it was not normal or was too scared to come and speak to a doctor. Yeah, so it's important to either talk to other people, friends and things, or to actually, if you're worried, just go and speak to a doctor about it. And yeah, yeah, you see people with that sort of issue all day, every day, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. Exactly. Or... Yeah, I, I just kind of like, if you don't talk to me about your periods, I'm like, what's going on here? This is completely <laughs> abnormal. <laughs> I feel I don't know how you feel about this Chloe but I feel over the last year or so people have become a lot more open with talking about women's health and I don't know if that's because I'm living in this like period insta bubble Um, (laughs) but I have noticed that you know people are starting to you know they'll tag friends and they're like look at this this is what we were talking about and I feel like that's something that started quite recently so I don't know, maybe the message is getting out there, but yeah, maybe it's just my skewed view of reality. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Because I get that with anxiety. I'm like, everyone's talking about anxiety, but maybe it's just me and my Instagram people. But um, no, I totally agree. Because I remember years ago, people were talking about, I don't know, I remember being at Glastonbury Festival when I was about 17 and seeing an advert for a moon cup and being horrified by this. I was like, can't believe <laughs> anyone would ever do that. And now half the people you meet are talking about this or you know different I know. options for that so that's so funny that you mentioned that actually because I think it was at Glastonbury that I first heard about moon cups yeah. and I was like what is this thing <laughs> yeah and like now I get asked about it like several times a week like I was with some friends at the weekend and they're like right Anita really need to talk to you about this moon cup business what is it all about <laughs> and I think that you know the moon cup has become so popular because people are you know some people just absolutely love it and they rave about it to their friends and they're just telling everyone. So, yeah, I think that's how it's become so popular over the last few years. Yeah, yeah. And just wanted to go back to what you mentioned about vulvas. And Hmm. um, I remember like a few years ago, this isn't about vulvas, it's about feet, but I was like really self-conscious about my feet. And then I went Hmm. on like a yoga sort of retreat for a week and I saw everyone's feet and everyone's feet were different and some people had bunions and some people had this. And I realised that my feet were not kind of abnormal at all. Yeah. And I think it might be the same with vulvas. We need to kind of do a bit of internet research, see some more, you know, different bodies, ones that yeah. aren't kind of people from pornography or something, and actually realise that there's some yeah. variety, everything's normal. Um, I'm sure there was an exhibition or something that had like people, a drawing of different vulvas. Yeah. And it was all different types I suppose and there's a really cool account called the vulva gallery ah okay perfect and it's got all sorts of pictures on there and they're amazing and I think you're so right that it's about perspective isn't it because you can get quite fixated on something about yourself but other people just don't see it and so other people might have been at that retreat looking at your feet thinking, oh, wow, her feet are amazing. Like she's got beautiful feet because they have something that they're worried about, about their body. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you don't see other people's vulvas, do you? I mean, maybe if you're in a shower in the gym or something like that. But you, it's a bit weird almost to be like looking at other people because you'd feel like, oh, she, she'll think I'm looking at her. But yeah. we don't get that opportunity. And I do agree that pornography has a lot to answer to because people see all of these women who probably have had some kind of surgery um it just gives a really skewed vision of what's normal mm-hmm. okay definitely going to check out that account and encourage people to as well um, yeah can we talk about smear tests and why they're yeah, important absolutely. and why yeah. we're so anxious about them this is my bread and butter so i actually did my phd about um well, about smear tests and about abnormal smears. So, yeah. Um, So, yeah. So I think first thing to say is that everyone sort of colloquially tends to call the smear test the cervical cancer test. Mm. Um, And so it's not really a cervical cancer test. It's not looking for cancer. It's a test to prevent cancer. So the cervix is the neck of the womb. So I always think about the, the womb or the uterus. So it's the means the same thing um it's like an upside down wine bottle (laughs) so the um where the fluid would be is the the body of the 
the womb. And that's where your baby would grow if you're pregnant. And then comes down into the cervix and so that's the neck of the womb um, and so when we're doing a smear test we're sampling the cells on the outside because that's where you can get abnormalities um, that are basically a result of having a persistent infection with the human papillomavirus so this causes huge anxiety so I think first of all we should just briefly talk about HPV yeah. so it's a virus that is just everywhere um, there's several different kinds, but there's specific types that can cause abnormality on the cervix. There's other kinds that can cause warts, um, so on the soles um, or the palms and also um, on your genitals as well. Um, but the kinds that cause abnormalities on the cervix, so basically they can be anywhere on your skin and sex gets them to the cervix. So actually even using a condom all the time wouldn't guarantee to protect you against the HPV um, infection. Um, so yeah, you get the virus. Pretty much everyone who's sexually active by the age of 50 will have had the virus. But if you've never had an abnormal smear test, you won't have known because some people can get it. It lasts for a couple of days and it just goes. And you can get the virus several times. So if you get the virus, then if it stays around, it starts to cause some abnormalities in the cells, which we can pick up on the smear test because the smear test uses a very soft brush to just exfoliate some of those cells away. We look at them under a microscope and we're looking for particular um, sort of appearances of the cells. And so if you have an abnormal smear test, you need to go for something called a colposcopy. So this fills people with absolute dread and I understand because it sounds awful um, and it's going to hospital having an examination by a doctor um, but it's not really that bad so I have lots of patients who come in and they cry we have a chat and I, I, I love having that moment to really explain to them what's happening and you know if you have to go for a colposcopy you must ask every question under the sun that you have because the worst thing as a doctor is knowing that your patient has walked out without understanding everything or with some concern still there. So when you come for a colposcopy, what we do is we basically, you'll lie in a special, um, you'll lie on the stirrups. So again, sounds worse than it is. They're not that uncomfortable. Um, and it just helps us to get you in the most perfect position so that we can look directly at the cervix. Um, and then so we put some dyes on. Um, it's a acetic acid, so it's a very mild vinegar. So it might smell a bit like a fish and chip shop in there. Um, and then we use iodine, um, which is a brown dye. Um, and we're just looking to see if we see any abnormal areas. And if we do, we might take a biopsy. That's a little pinch of tissue, so it's really, really tiny, and we can send it off to the lab and kind of work out what exactly is going on. Um, and then if it's just mildly abnormal, we'll observe you over a couple of months to see if it'll go away on its own. So not all abnormal smears will need any kind of treatment. So lots of abnormalities, if left, will go away because the body will eventually clear the virus that causes them. But some will need some treatment. So that means removing the abnormal cells to prevent cancer developing in the future. But it's so common to get an abnormal smear. So one in 10 women will have an abnormal smear test. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I think it's something that people think, oh, there's something wrong with me. I'm dirty. I've been promiscuous. None of those things it just does not apply. Um, and I think as well, like people don't really talk about having abnormal smears because I have a lot of patients who come and they're like, no, no, this has never happened to any of my friends. And I say, no, trust me, go home, chat to your friends. And then they come back a few months later and they're like, you know what? You're right. Loads of my friends have had abnormal smears. So again, I think we just need to talk about it and just get it out there that it's something that happens to the best of us. It's not a sign of being promiscuous, um, or being dirty and, even if you have one partner for the whole entire lifetime, you can still get HPV. So it's really important to get tested. And is, is HPV something that would show up in an STD test then? No, no, it's not because we're not, in a way we're not really that interested in the HPV, shall I say? We're more interested in the abnormal cells because if you just take swabs from 
you know, 100 people, most of them will have some kind of HPV at some point, but it doesn't mean that they have any kind of abnormal cells at the time. So even if you have an STI check, you still need to go for a smear test. But equally, a smear test doesn't check for STIs. So if you have a smear test, you'll st- if you um, you know if you need to go for a, a sexual health screen, you'll still need to do that in addition. Yeah, yeah, that is so interesting because I did not even realise that it wasn't a test for cancer. It's about testing for, you know, the abnormal cells and for yeah. getting that just knowing if that's there and kind of getting in there early is so important. Exactly, and it's actually the number one way of preventing cervical cancer. Okay. Um, so cervical cancer is something that affects one in 135 women in the lifetime. So it's not hugely common compared to other cancers, for example, but it's the most common cancer in younger women. Um, so, you know, it's something very simple that takes a couple of minutes that you can do to protect yourself and prevent that from happening in the future. So it's just so important. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So if you've been putting off your smear, listeners that definitely get that booked in I went quite recently and actually it was quite a good experience for me because the the nurse doing it was just really funny you could tell she was really just making a big effort to put people at ease and she just made me laugh and it turned into quite a good experience and it's nothing compared to a bikini wax for example yeah exactly I think there's an advert yeah Yeah, exactly (laughs) I think there's an advert about that um and you know I think that a lot of people are like, oh, no, I haven't been because I think it'll hurt. But it really doesn't take that long. And trust me, having cervical cancer definitely hurts more than a smear test. And then also a lot of people say that it was really uncomfortable when they had their smear test. So they don't want to come to colposcopy. But the thing I would say about that is that it depends sometimes where you are in your cycle as to how uncomfortable it is to have a smear test. So a lot of people say it's more uncomfortable when they're just before their period. Um, So if you're worried about that, then you could try and avoid that time of the month. Um, And also, when we do colposcopy in the hospital, we have because we have the evil looking stirrups, it actually makes it a bit easier to find your cervix. Um, So a lot of people are quite worried about that, because they said that part of it was uncomfortable. And also, I don't want to say anything bad about um, nurses in GP surgeries, because they're amazing. But we do it all day every day so Mm -hmm. sometimes it can just be a little bit easier for us so um just to yeah be aware that if you've had an abnormal smear and it was a hideous experience it's not necessarily going to be the same if you have to go for a colposcopy that's very reassuring that's really good to know um so i did get quite a few questions in from people Mm. on instagram um someone was asking about pms or pmd and are yep. there any supplements or strategies to combat this, the mood mood swings and, and that aspect of it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, PMS, uh, so premenstrual syndrome, or um, PMDD, so that's premenstrual dysphoric disorder, uh, basically means the kind of symptoms that you get uh, before your period generally. Um, and largely speaking we're talking about mood changes but also um, PMS in particular can be things like bloating um, and you know feeling quite like waterlogged um, that they're the sort of two main physical symptoms that I see the most I think it's really difficult so in terms of supplements there's not really any kind of like one supplement that I would ever recommend to the general population. I think the only supplement that we should all be using, especially now that it's autumn, is vitamin D. Um, That's really important. Um, And that's actually really important for a lot of um, women's health um, conditions as well, because a lot of them are associated with low vitamin D. So things like PCOS and endometriosis. So women, definitely, we all need our vitamin D. Um, But yeah, I think there are some people, you know, anecdotally will say, XYZ supplements really good, but there's not really anything that's got a huge evidence base behind it. Um, but you know, if there are things that you want to try, by all means do, um, and see how you feel. Um, but I think the biggest thing with, um, PMS and PMDD is just kind of being aware that it is actually a real thing and allowing yourself to feel like crap some days, you know, I think we have to have this appreciation and I think it's something that you covered really nicely in one of your um, previous podcasts, Chloe, is that, you know, female hormones 
will have an impact on your mood and how you feel at different times in the cycle. So estrogen and progesterone are the predominant female hormones, but all your hormones, there's a very, very complex interaction of them all. So they can interact with cortisol, the stress hormone, um, insulin, you know, hormones that make you feel differently about your appetite and all, just so many different things. So I think really, and it's, it's hard to really kind of generalize because everyone feels different at different times in their cycle. And it's very individual to that individual person. But I think just having an appreciation that it's not something that's going on in your head. It's something that's being caused by a chemical process in your body to allow yourself to have this kind of like fluctuation in, in your mood, in your activity levels, in you know the way your body feels throughout the month, because it's highly dynamic. I think we think of our menstrual cycle as being, uh, you know, your period, the section in between, and then PMS. But actually, throughout that time, if you look at your hormones, even on an hour to hour basis, they're completely fluctuating. So you can't expect to have this kind of like, you know, very steady state because we're dynamic beings. So yeah, I think um, I'm now waffling, but I think that, you know, we just need to realize that it's, it's a real thing and it's a connection between our biology and our brain and, you know, all the things in between. It's, it's real. And I, I don't think that we can always get rid of it. I think there are some basic things that we can all do I think that, you know, making sure that we are sleeping well is so important. I think that's something that I feel a lot of people are talking about at the moment. But I, I don't know, I, I talk to a lot of my patients and I just realize that we're just not sleeping well as a as a nation. People, you know, feel that it's normal to say, well, I get five hours of sleep and they're probably quite rubbish hours of sleep. Or, you know, I sleep five hours a night on the week and then I try and sleep in at the weekends but you can't really you can't bank sleep like that you have to be making sure that you're keeping it steady having good sleep hygiene all of these things will affect our hormones um, also making sure that we are having a good diet obviously at some times in the month you know you just want to sit and eat crap and that's okay again allow yourself to do that but if you're kind of using it that as a a bit of a sticking plaster, then I think that's a time to step back and think, well, okay, I'm going to eat that. I'm going to enjoy it. But is it actually in the long run doing me any good? So I think that we have to, I think diet's a tricky one because I don't like the idea of the word diet almost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we have to see it as a way of eating. And, and if I want somebody, you know, I have some patients who just have the most atrocious diets but if I say the word diet to them, they're going to be like, no, 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 see you later. So I like to kind of talk about how they're getting goodness into their body and what they're doing to, you know, like show their body some love by what they're putting into it. So I think that that's another massive area. I think alcohol is a big one as well. Um, and again, I really liked one of the podcasts that you did um, about alcohol, um, because to be honest with you, I don't really drink that much anymore because it makes me feel really, really anxious. Um, but I think a lot of people haven't quite got the insight into the fact that going home and drinking several glasses of wine after they've had a stressful day probably is making their stress worse. And I think that, you know, if you have times in your cycle where you feel really stressed, drinking is not really helping and probably not, it's probably making the situation potentially worse. And, and so I think that, you know, we have this idea, especially from a lot of like films and TV programs, that when you're stressed and you've had a bad day at work, that's what you do. You go home and you, you sit on the sofa and you drink lots of wine. Um, but again, it's just kind of like taking that step back and being like, OK, I'm doing these things, but is it actually making me feel better? Is it really helping me in the long run? And so I think they're my three main things that I think people could really think about if they they find that at particular times of the month, they're really struggling. You know, are you implementing good strategies to cope with it? Yeah, so it sounds like really taking care of yourself. And I love Definitely. the idea of getting nourishment in your body. And I suppose 
we often hear about cutting out the, the junk, but actually if we focus on putting good stuff in, that's a lot more of a positive message, I think, and probably less likely to make you want to rebel against not having yeah. junk and eat, actually eating loads of junk, you know, to make up for that. So I'm Exactly. Nice. And as a disclaimer, I did come home from work today and felt really tired and I ate a piece of chocolate cake. So I'm not saying all I'm good. perfect, all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it's all kind of like, you know, in moderation and in perspective. So now I'm going to eat loads of vegetables for my dinner. <laughs> good, 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 good stuff. Um, so another question that came in was about endometriosis and yeah. could it cause bloating? Because this person is saying that they look like they're six months pregnant. Yeah. Okay. So endometriosis is something that um, I see a lot and it's getting talked about a lot on social media, which I'm really happy about, but it is, it can be a really horrible disease. So it's basically where, so the endometrium is the lining of the womb. So that's the bit that's um, getting shed when you have your period. And so if you have endometriosis, it means you've got um, tissue very similar to the lining of the womb in the pelvis. So it's outside of the uterus. So it could be um, on the ovaries, on your bladder, on your bowel, and also on the lining of the um, of the pelvis. So the skin in there is called the peritoneum. So you might think, okay, well, is that a problem? Well, yeah, it is because even though it's in the wrong place, it still reacts to the um, the hormone cycle. So when the lining of your womb is being shed, this um, endometrium that's outside of the womb is also being shed, but it doesn't have anywhere to go. So it causes a lot of inflammation and it can actually cause scarring inside your, um, inside your tummy, basically. Um, and so depending on where it is, depends on when you get pain. So it typically causes um, pain on sex a lot, um, can be really, really uncomfortable if everything's quite inflamed and stuck, but then also can cause pain when you have your bowels open, if it's on your bowel um, and when you go to the toilet to wee as well. But yeah, it can cause bloating. Um, and again, that's because of kind of just all the general kind of inflammation and it irritates your bowel. So normally when you are bloated, it is your bowel that's reacting. And it's probably from all the inflammation in there that's going on. I find a lot of people with endometriosis also get quite constipated. Um, and so that can also add to the problem and make you feel quite bloated. So yeah, if you are worried about bloating, um, definitely go and speak to your GP and then they can sort of ask you lots of other questions and try and work out whether it might be something like endometriosis. Um, there's lots of other reasons, of course. Um, but then if they think it might be something like endo, then they can obviously um, refer you to the clinic and we can see people in hospital. That's really interesting. I'm sure, was there a book out recently about endometriosis, about how it's kind of this hidden illness that so many people yeah. are struggling with and yet... No one talks about people don't really know what it is. And Lee, was it Lena Dunham? Lena Dunham. Yeah, yeah. Who so really suffered with it. She had endometriosis and she wrote an article in Vogue. I think it was last summer about how she had a hysterectomy. So I just have to stress that having a hysterectomy is very unusual for endometriosis. Um, it's really difficult to uh, comment on her case, obviously, because I, I'm not her doctor. <laughs> um, and so I don't know exactly what was going on, but it would be very unusual um, to do that for someone with endometriosis. There's lots of other different kind of treatments that we can do before. So that would be medications um, and also less radical surgery. So things like removing the deposits that are there, removing any scar tissue and adhesions and that kind of thing. So if you do think that you've got endometriosis, don't think that that automatically means you're going to need a hysterectomy. It's so individual. There's just, you know, endometriosis can range from being completely mild and people don't even know they have it to being incredibly severe. It's such a spectrum and the treatment very much depends on how severe it is, but also where it is. So doesn't automatically mean hysterectomy. Okay, well, that's good Good news, I think, at least. Um, okay, I've got a couple more questions. So someone's asking yeah. about, um, when you have a caesarean, do you need vaginal seeding? 
Okay, so this is very interesting. So again, this is kind of related to my PhD, actually. Um, so yeah, so my PhD was a little bit about the vaginal microbiome. So you know how we've all heard about the gut microbiome. Um, so all the good bacteria that lives in your gut. So you have the same thing in your vagina. And that's essentially what I studied for four years. Um, and so the concept of um, vaginal seeding comes from this, um, lots of data that shows that babies who are born by cesarean section have a higher risk of things like um, asthma um, and diabetes um, and also obesity. And so one of the theories is that it's because they don't get exposed to the vaginal bacteria when they're born. Um, so the first bacteria that they get exposed to is the, the bacteria in the operating room. Um, so yeah, so what people are trying to do is replicate that in a baby who's been born through a cesarean section um, by putting um, a swab inside the vagina to get some of the vaginal bacteria and then sort of like smearing it over the baby's face and around the mouth and the nose so that the baby still gets that bacteria because the the principle is that the first bacteria that you're exposed to programs your immune system so it's very very interesting the only thing is that at the moment we can't support that kind of thing because we don't know that it's safe so again, this goes back to the whole like natural is better thing. There are bacteria in our um, vagina that can actually make babies quite sick. And so even babies who are born to healthy mothers in a very small number of cases can become unwell um, and get infections and sepsis in early life. And it may be due to bacteria that's there that doesn't affect the mother, but then actually it affects the baby. So because we still don't really understand that, we can't recommend it. Um, there are some studies that are going on that might be able to provide more information, but at the moment, it actually seems like the most important thing is actually breastfeeding and early skin-to-skin -skin contact, and they can actually negate for um, the fact that they've been born by cesarean section. It's also important to remember that there are some what we call confounders, so some reasons um, in the mothers, for example, who had to have a cesarean section that might also mean that their babies are more likely to get certain health problems in the future. So it's really difficult to say at the moment, but unfortunately in any NHS, uh, can't speak, NHS hospital um, in the UK at the moment, I don't think anyone's doing it because we just can't guarantee that it's safe. That is absolutely fascinating. I'm, I'm really interested in, in the gut and the gut, you know, brain link and yeah. so much of the studies I've only done in rodents so we really have no idea really about yeah. so much of that whole area and it's just a case of waiting and seeing what, what exactly what comes of it in the next sort of few years and decades so be but that's the thing I mean see. like humans are so diverse and it's so much easier to control an animal in a lab mm -hmm. than you can a human being because yeah. you can you know you can control for so many things whereas we're all like you know we've got different genetics we eat different things we live in different places so I mean, the microbiome is just fascinating, but I think that some of the kind of um, articles that I've read, people have kind of really overinterpreted um, the very sort of like primitive results at the moment. Okay, interesting. So watch, watch this space. Yeah, um, definitely. So another question came in um, about the pill and mm -hmm. mental health aspects of it, because from my experience, I've heard some people say, oh, I tried this one pill and it made me like really depressed. Another person says, oh, I need the pill to help me with my anxiety. It really helps me. So is there kind of an official, what's the official advice? So, well, the official advice from the gynae geek <laughs> is that <laughs> we are all individuals and I don't think there's one answer for everyone. Um, so... There have been a lot of studies out recently over the last few years saying that the, the pill causes depression. Well, the studies haven't really proven that the pill causes depression, but they've shown that in some people who take the pill, they're more likely to have mental health problems. Um, there's just no data to really show that it causes it. Um, from my experience, I definitely agree that for some people, particular pills may not suit them and may actually affect their mood. And again, this is the thing about sort of understanding that hormones can affect your mood. And so it's having that appreciation and, and again, realizing that it's not something that you're making up, it's not in your head, it may actually be happening. Now, the average GP can actually prescribe about 30 different kinds of pill 
So just because one doesn't agree with you doesn't mean that another will be the same. So if you find that the pill is the most convenient kind of contraception for you, then by all means, you know, you could definitely try something else. And it might just be that one pill because they all have subtly different um, hormones and different concentrations. So the reaction will be different. I do agree that some people actually feel better on the pill. Um, and so, again, it's just it's an individual thing. And I think it's it's partly due to our genetics. And But I do think there is a subset of women definitely who the pill um, does have a negative impact on. Um, so I think, yeah, just, just be aware that it, it may be a thing. But what I really don't like is people scaremongering and then people who are completely happy on the pill being made to think that they need to stop it. So I think my other big message would be if you're happy with your contraception, it doesn't matter what somebody else experienced if you're happy, stick with it, because we are all different. You know, we're not computer algorithms; we're human beings, and so it's just it's so individual. So don't don't feel afraid. If somebody tells you it happened to them, then that's unfortunate. But if it's not happening to you, you don't have to stop your contraception. Yeah, that makes complete sense. I think it's mm. about getting to know your own body and tracking your own mood and noticing yeah. what, what things make an impact and. Yeah, I think a lot of people maybe don't realise that if they were taking a pill, it could affect their mood. And at least if you yeah. know, then you're aware. And, you know, I think that's important just to get that message exactly. out Exactly. Yeah. And since you um, mentioned about tracking mood, um, there's a new app that I've been um, working on, um, which is called Moody. Um, so you can download it in the App Store. And it's amazing. So it's kind of like a hormone tracker so you can track your menstrual cycle and then track how you feel um, both in terms of mood um, and also um, certain physical symptoms as well um, and you can just start to see if there are patterns because it is this you know tracking is just can give you so much information about yourself so you can essentially use yourself as your own guinea pig and just work out what works for you and and because I think it's, you know, sometimes it's hard to remember what you had for dinner. So how do you remember how you felt on day 25 of your cycle last month, two months ago? Um, so the great thing about the app as well is that it gives you a report every month. And also um, you can record uh, voice memos, um, which everyone's loving at the moment. So you just kind of like, you know, little memo, it's private, um, and you've got it there to refer back to. So I think that getting to know your own body and how your body reacts to your hormones and your external environment is so empowering. That sounds absolutely amazing because, yeah, just knowing, right, on day 26, I feel like not leaving the house and not talking to anyone, I just need to rest on that day. Or yeah. you know, on day 15, I've got loads of energy, I should plan a big walk or something on that day. I think that's exactly that's so that information. Yeah. And that's the thing I really like as well is that, you know, we think about our menstrual cycle and our mood as a negative thing. But actually, there are days when you just like you feel amazing and you can totally use that to your advantage, like times in the month where you feel really sociable. You might want to, you know, like make all your plans then with your friends and then just be aware that there are weeks when you think, God, I really don't want to go out. And, you know, when you're like finishing work and you think, God, why did I make plans? I just want to go home and like put my feet up. Yeah. And so you can you can manipulate your month and use it to your advantage. So, yeah, definitely a fan of, of tracking those kind of things and yeah, using all that information. Amazing. And I'll put the link to the app in the show notes as well. Um, this has been a fascinating conversation. I've learned so much. I'm so excited Good. to listen to this. Um, where can people find out more about you and what you do and what you're up to? Uh, yeah, so I'm on Instagram at gynegeek. Um, and also I have a website, which is gynegeek.com. Um, and I am releasing a book on the Yay. 7th of March next year. So wow. if you want to buy that. You'll find the um, the link to the Amazon page on my Instagram profile as well. So um, yeah, check it out. It's uh, just really nice summary of women's health and kind of lots of the kind of questions that we've discussed today. Um, all the kind of things that you want to know but don't necessarily want to ask Dr. Google. Ask them to Dr. Mitra instead. <laughs> Amazing! That is very very exciting. Really looking forward to that. Um, well, thank you so much for speaking to me. I've just no remembered problem. I was going to ask you one more question. Yeah, go um, ahead. 
I like to ask guests this because we are all struggling with something. There is yeah. no one that is has no problems and you know is living a perfect life. So, is there anything that you're struggling with at the moment that you you'd care to share with us? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, this is something that we kind of briefly touched upon uh, before we started recording, but. I think one of the things I really struggle with um, is kind of social media and living an online life, which is kind of ironic because, uh, you know, that's what I spend a lot of my spare time doing. Um, But as I was saying, you know, a few years ago, I used to use social media and followed a lot of like fitness accounts and a lot of fitness and health bloggers. And I just really compared myself to them. And just became so obsessed with exercise and what I was eating and what that other person was doing and what they were lifting in the gym and that kind of thing. And I just became so obsessed with exercise that actually I didn't have a period for two years um, because I was just completely overdoing it. I was completely stressed out. I was doing my PhD at the time and um, doing some of my um, clinical training as well. So I was working like ridiculous hours, then trying to like train like an athlete, trying to like meal prep like some kind of like food blogger and you know just putting so much stress on myself um and then I had a bit of a like a meltdown and a bit of a realization and so that was sort of a really big turnaround for me and I but I see a lot of people on social media going through the same thing and I just think it's really important to be aware that what you see isn't always um what you get. (laughs) Um, And then I think now as well, I do still struggle with that because I think it's really hard. I I never, I never wanted to do social media to become like a influencer or like, you know, Insta famous or whatever. And I mean, I'm so grateful to the fact that I have so many followers. It's amazing because it's just such a great way of getting my message out there. But it also is quite stressful because I want to help people and I want to put the information out there. But then I get a lot of people who want me to be their personal doctor and I can't do that. Um, I'm not allowed to start with. Um, uh, It's forbidden by the GMC, so the people who give me my medical license, not allowed to interact with patients online. And it's not ethical for me to do that either because I don't have access to people's medical records. Um, I can't see them in person. I only work in the NHS. So that can be quite tricky as well. And... uh, I think as well, like we just, yeah, I think, you know, to a certain extent we do still, well, I still compare myself to other people sometimes. And I think, oh gosh, they're like creating loads of really useful content. And I think, gosh, why can't I do that? I need to put more information out there. I need to help people more. But, you know, again, it's just having that realization that, you know, I have like a more than full-time job um, Mm -hmm. and do this all on the side as well as do my research and then try to be, you know, a good friend, a good girlfriend, daughter, sister, um, all those kind of things. I think I just always try and remind myself that you can't do it all and you really have to look after yourself. And that's something that I'm, yeah, I've massively improved over the last few years, but I'm still really working on as well. So yeah, it's not, uh, it's not all sunshine and roses. I'm very fortunate to be in the position that I am in. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, most people that you see on social media don't always show you the bad side because that might be a bit weird to post sometimes. You know, we want to show our best side, don't we? So um, yeah, I'm definitely not moaning. I'm very grateful to be in this position, but it, it's not it's not easy. Um, yeah, living the online life, I would say. Mm, totally. And I think, I mean, everyone, probably everyone that uses social media can relate to that of comparison. It's impossible to get away from. As human beings, we naturally compare ourselves to other people yeah. that's part of our nature and the fact that we're just exposed to what everyone's doing all the time it just kind of amplifies that so much so thanks for sharing that I think everyone probably will will relate to that I know I definitely can <laughs> um yeah yeah and you know it's I, I know a lot of people a lot of my clients are people with lots of Instagram followers and things and you know, you do hear the other side of it, it isn't always. Yeah. It isn't just glamorous holidays and photo shoots. Actually, it's extremely hard work. <laughs> Obviously, it is an amazing job in lots of ways if you're an influencer, but, you know, it's not yeah. it's kind of, um, it's not the full picture that we see. So, yeah. Exactly. Thanks for sharing that. Anyway, amazing. No Thank you for talking to Thank me. Thank you. And, yeah, hopefully no we'll meet in real life at some at some stage. 
Yeah, definitely. Launch, maybe. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> I'm invited myself. Um, well, that's all my mum keeps asking me about. Yeah. Every yeah. time I mention the book, she's like, what about the book launch? <laughs> it's very important, very important. <laughs> I know. Oh. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Chloe. Thank you. Thanks so much. See you soon. <laughs> thanks. Bye.